Thank you for sharing with us in worship today. This is worship for the second Sunday of Lent at Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church in Roanoke, Virginia. We have this special online content for you, but we invite you always to join us in person at 11 a.m. any Sunday. I'm Pastor Robert Stutes. During the season of Lent, we begin our worship each week with a Lenten meditation from the famed Icelandic poet and pastor Hallgrim Petterson. These words are almost 400 years old and they're still beloved in the country of Iceland. Listen to these words. Whenever in act or word I slight your warning grace, like Peter, I deny you, Lord. So toward me, turn your face. O Master, turn and look on me in love untold. Send that same searching glance which broke the apostle's heart of old. Until with weeping eyes I gaze toward heaven. Then, Savior, speak the word, arise, arise, restored, forgiven. So for our centering prayer this morning, I invite you to use the next moment. With each inhale, use the word, Savior, speak your word. With each exhale, the words, arise, restored, forgiven. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you that it is your glory always to have mercy. Lord, be gracious to all who go astray from your ways. Give them penitent hearts and steadfast faith so that they might embrace and hold fast the unchanging truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your son. We pray in his name, for he is the one who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. During the season of Lent, we're careful to always include at least one song of the cross, and we begin this day with Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
Today I'm going to share the invitation to the Lord's table and to confession. That's a part of our in-person worship. I know you're not able to be with us at the Lord's table this day. We're going to be making a concerted effort to open the table to as many people as possible. I hope possible you can be with us in person if it's impossible for you. We'll make every effort to be bringing communion to you during the Lent and Easter season as a part of our emphasis upon the Lord's table. And yet I still invite you to join in the spirit of confession. Hear the words. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Remember each day to pray the Show Me Prayer during the season of Lent. Each day, lift up these words. Dear Lord, just for today, Please show me one special way in which I can share light and love to someone. Show me one thing I need to stop doing or saying, and show me one special thing that I can learn about you. Please be generous in sharing any reflections that you have with us through your comments on Facebook or YouTube. Thanks so much. Our first scripture reading comes to us from the prophet Micah chapter 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Thanks be to God. I hope you'll, I hope you'll enjoy this next song, which goes along so well with this week's theme, When I Needed a Neighbor. When I needed a neighbor, were you there? Were you there? When I needed neighbor were you there and the creed and the color and the name what matter were you there i was hungry and thirsty were you there were you there i was hungry and thirsty were you naked were you there and the creed and the color and the name what matter were you there when i needed a shelter were you there were you there when i needed a shelter were you Wherever you travel, I'll be there. And 
the crew and the color and the name won't matter, I'll be there. A scripture reading from the Gospels from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was, a na I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those, his, those at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not, did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy your message for us today. Amen. We've been working our way through this top 10 list, and these three weeks, number six, seven, and eight, are focused on what we sometimes call the three simple rules. We did on the, in this order. We began by talking about stay in love with God. Last week, do no harm, and this week, simply do good. How important that is, just doing good. And specifically, we're calling it eight works of mercy. Now, have you ever heard somebody called a do-gooder? That's usually not a compliment. It's usually aimed at somebody who's trying to do something to help somebody out, but they end up making a fool of themselves. You know, I think you can be called worse things than being a do-gooder. Sometimes we do the wrong thing, but at least we're trying. The list in our booklet talks about the eight works of mercy. Let me lift those up to you. They are doing, these are doing um, good works, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, feeding the hungry, giving generously to the needs of others, seeking justice, ending oppression and discrimination, and addressing the needs of the poor. That's a great guideline list as we think about how we live out our faith, as we think about that um, show me prayer each day, Lord, show me some way to share your love and light with someone else. Doing good is a consistent theme of what we are called to be about. And, and again, the three simple rules remind us that our relationship with God and then our actions, the things we avoid doing and the things we add. I love Love it when during Lent we think not just about the things we take away, but about the things that we add. And I hope you're finding some things to add. Even a simple thing can be a blessing to someone. Notice that this list of eight also included both things that I just decided to do myself, but also the things we can do together in order to make the world a more just place. The Church of Jesus Christ is called to link arms together and influence the world we live in, not just by addressing hurts one at a time, but finding ways to stop the hurts from happening in the first place.
Let's look a little more specifically at John Wesley's words. He put it this way, it is expected of all who continue in Methodist societies and classes that they should continue to evidence their desire for salvation, and here it is, by doing good, by being in every kind merciful after their power as they have opportunity, doing good of every possible sort as far as possible to all. Doing good of every kind to everybody as far as it is possible, as far as it depends upon you. Now, the list of eight is not a magic list. You can make it a little shorter. You can make it a little longer. You might think of some things to add. Wesley's words also go a little more deep. Deep, his original um, list went this way. This is how he described it. I only tweaked the wording a bit to, just to try to make it more understandable, not to water it down. So these are some of the things he said about doing good. He said, as you have the power, always be in every way merciful. As you have the opportunity, do good of every possible sort and as far as possible to all people. Then he added this, do good both to their bodies and to their souls. I think that's important. You know, some organizations like the Salvation Army are known for showing kindness to people's bodies, just reaching out in mercy. Some organizations are more missionary focused and they're all about the preaching, trying to get people saved, focusing on people's souls. The genius of our faith is when we put those two together, when we care for body and we care for soul. Examples of showing, of doing good to someone's body, sharing food for the hungry, sharing clothing for the naked, visiting or helping those that are sick, visiting or helping those that are in prison, the very things we heard Jesus say in chapter 25 of Matthew. As far as their souls, what would that be? Instructing, reproving, which is showing correction, exhorting, which is giving strong guidance or encouragement, instructing, reproving, exhorting, all with whom we have contact. You would think those are the jobs of a Bible study leader. We don't always remember that these are our jobs for others as well. We can instruct, reprove, and exhort. Wow. Wesley goes on to say, be especially careful to do good to those that are of your family of faith or who are seeking to be part of your family of faith. That could mean giving them employment. It could mean helping them in their business. Now, I think we would especially add today when... Um, when we also know that there are many people in business who are not Christian, sometimes you can impact them as well too. You can patronize someone and be a positive influence to them. We don't want to become ingrown and only shop among our own. Churches sometimes sometimes face this um, when, when we have to make an important business decision and we find out that the best practice is maybe working with someone outside our church so that there's no um, suspicion of, of somebody getting a, a business advantage because of their place in the church. It can get tricky. Wesley goes on, do good by being diligent and frugal where possible that the gospel be not blamed. What does that mean, that the gospel be not blamed? That means, an, that's what it means to me now, an, an absence of diligence and an absence of frugality can actually reflect negatively upon your mission, your gospel message. Um, so, so being careful by the way we comport ourselves in all of these small things can help give credibility to um, the kind of um, witness that we give. Let's think of a silly example. You remember the old days when the paper boy used to come around once a month to collect for the paper? Um, uh, imagine your paper boy comes around and you, you are just always kind of cranky and you gripe about not getting the paper on a certain day. And back when it was about 10 cents a day, maybe you give the paper boy $2 and 90 cents instead of three because you didn't get a paper. And so you get a pretty good reputation of being, being, um, a poor influence. Somebody, you probably didn't even want to ring the doorbell. And then Christmas comes around and you hand that paper boy a card about some, something going on at your church. Guess what? He's probably going to throw it in the trash. You've already shown what you're like. And if you're a part of that church, he doesn't want to go. So 
the way we conduct ourselves with kindness, with generosity, with, with wisdom, with diligence, can actually improve or detract from our witness if we're not careful. Wesley also says, beware those who say we are not to do good unless our hearts be free to do it. What does that mean? It's kind of like, well, if the opportunity arises, I'll do it, but I'm not going to go out of my way to do it. Look for opportunities. Don't just wait for them to fall into your lap. And then he ends with these words, do good by running with patience the race that is set before you, by denying yourself, by taking up your cross each day, by willing, being willing to bear the reproach of Christ, by being willing, listen to this, by being willing to be the filth and offscouring of the world, by being prepared for people to speak evil of you falsely for God's sake. It's kind of unusual after talking about simple ways of showing kindness that Wesley would add the words, just be ready to be insulted, be ready to be mistreated, and be ready to be lied about. I wonder, well, no, I don't even wonder. I'm sure there was some personal experience he went through that caused him to add those words. These words are really a tall order. They help us to look at doing good in a whole new light. I want to take just a minute to turn to another source as well. This is a book that I ran across some time ago called Wonder Drug. Let me find it here. Wonder Drug. It's backwards probably on your screen, but it says seven scientifically proven ways that serving others is the best medicine for yourself. Look at that little um, graphic there with the hand reaching up out of the crowd to reach another hand. It's written by Stephen Treziak and Anthony Mazzarelli. Both of them are MDs. Now, these two doctors write about the beneficial effects of serving others. Now, we would not be surprised to find and read an article about how the things we do to serve others can have a good effect in some other community, in a poor neighborhood, or around the world, or in the Ukraine, or whatever. But his, this approach is really, really different. It approaches the works of mercy from a different point of view, that not only do these things help others, but these are things we actually do to literally help ourselves. And these are not just crazy concepts. This is based on scientific and medical studies. This is not two young pastors who wrote this book. This is two physicians. Believe it or not, here are some of the things mentioned in the book, some of the connections between living a life of serving and the actual benefits not the but the not to up oh, excuse me not to others but to me all of these things can be an outgrowth improved physical health being more physically fit living longer less pain less heart disease less dementia less depression less anxiety less burnout, less addiction, more happiness, more financial success. I actually talked about this book while substitute teaching in, in middle school this week and, and was lifting it up to them and reminding them that this really changes the way we, we look at things. That, that if I spend an hour helping uh, a neighbor who um, has is not able to take care of her home. If I spend an hour doing that, I might think, well, that cost me an hour. But if I take this book seriously, I might say, hey, I might live two hours longer than if I had not done that. It might be a good investment after all. It might improve not only my quality of life, but even my quantity of life. I've heard tell that sometimes small groups who have very needy folks will spend a lot of time talking with them and sometimes they find that the more they talk and, and kind of help talk things out with this person who is needy, they actually seem to get worse. They just, they kind of like the attention, but they keep talking about their problems and focusing on problems and it becomes a dead end. One of the best things these folks said was to say the best thing you can do for that some person is not just talk about their issues, but to go out and do something find some way to make a difference. If, if nothing else, bring that person with you and go down to the walking trail and pick up some trash. 
The best thing you can do to spin out of being self-centered and preoccupied is to go out and do for others. The reason for the title Wonder Drug, I think, comes from the fact that there are physicians there and that so often we hear maybe about a new medicine that comes out that has all these miraculous effects for us, maybe a few side effects too, you know, and it costs a whole lot, but it's called a wonder drug. And the doctors were saying, you know, if there was a drug you could get down at the pharmacy that did all these things, we'd spend a lot of money on it. But you don't have to spend a dime Well, you might spend a few dimes along the way, but spending time is the big thing. To serve others often doesn't cost you much at all, but it's like a wonder drug, not only to make the world a better place, but to make my life better. I want to share one other thing from the Wonder Drug book. It talked about four ways of living that we sometimes see in people. There are four patterns that we want to talk about. One is somebody, and it has to do with your view of self and your view of others. One is somebody who has a high view of self, but a low view of others. And the book calls that person an egomaniac. They're very selfish and they only think of themselves. By the way, I read something interesting in the book I never thought of, that the worst kind of egomaniac is a friendly egomaniac. If you run into a cruel egomaniac, at least you know what you're dealing with. But a friendly egomaniac may cause you to to trust them and do something you later regret, something that causes you to get burned. So beware of the person who has a high view of self and a low view of others. What about someone who has a low view of self and a low view of others. This person is described in the book as a slouch. I think there might could be a better word, but I couldn't think of one. Somebody who's basically kind of apathetic. They're not going to care for themselves. They're not going to care for others. What about someone who has a high view of others and a low view of self? Wouldn't that be the Christian thing? Actually, such a person is called a doormat. They end up being, being used and they burn out very easily. They find they have nothing left. The challenge is to have a high view of others and a high view of self. To have good self-esteem and good esteem for others. And that's called being a success. There's so much we could talk about in this, in this series we th- as we think about the works of mercy. But, you know, you just have to get out and do it. If you can't find anything... Um, Just leave your house and go somewhere and say, Lord, help me pay attention. Go to the park, um, go to the store, um, do something, do something. What if you're not able to get out a lot? Well, actually, I have seen it. I have seen people who are good encouragers just by the notes they send and the ways they respond on social media. They have a way of putting out fires, of bringing God's love to a situation of need. There are just so many ways that you can pour out that mercy on others. Let's join together as we pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together when we've learned so much about what it means to be a sheep instead of a goat, about what it means to be authentic in our care for others, to have an other-centered life, but not not to lose ourselves in the process. Lord, we can't treat others with esteem unless we see ourselves with esteem there. So help us, help us to do that. I pray for each one who is sharing in this worship service online. God, I pray for the upcoming opportunities to share at the Lord's table. May we, may we be amazed by the results of what happens when we give priority to receiving your presence at the Lord's table of breaking bread with others in your name. All our prayers I offer this, all these prayers I offer this day in the name of our Savior, and I pray as he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Thank you for sharing with us in this worship online time. Many thanks for the generous gifts that you offer to the ministry of our church family that help touch lives and share light and love in practical ways to reach our community, to be there on Wednesday afternoons for our children. So many things happen even in these times of struggle because of your love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, there's information at the end of the worship video on how you can um, give either by um, dropping a check in the mail or by giving online. What, whatever you choose, that's, that's a blessing and we uh, do, do appreciate it so much. Look forward for the time to share in in-person communion sometime during the Lent Easter season. We'll be reaching out to folks, but if we miss you, um, you call me, you comment, you let me know. We'll be glad to arrange something as soon as we can to share communion, to extend the table to you. Um, I hope you can participate in the online um, opportunity to um, um, do the two-hour communion class as well, too. We're going to be doing it, in, doing it in person, but we're going to be making it available the end of the month through Zoom. So take note of that date, and that's a way that you can have that learning content as well this month. A great opportunity for the season of Lent. We're going to be using in every service during this series at least one Charles Wesley song, and today is no exception. Our closing song is a wonderful song, one of my favorite Wesley songs that talks about our ties with each other and then how that propels us out to be agents of light in the world to do our work. Christ from whom all blessings flow. from whom all blessings flow, perfecting the saints below. Hear us who thy nature share, who thy mystic body are. Join us in one spirit, join, let us still i